Good afternoon. I am Noelle Ellerson Im, Associate Executive Director for Advocacy and Governance with AASA, the School Superintendents Association. Thank you for joining us today with today's webinar, Weighing the Pros and Cons of Tools like ChatGPT. I'm excited about today's conversation, the insights and expertise that today's panelists will share with you, and looking forward to the question and answers to get you the real-time information that will be helpful to you in your district day to day. I'd like to start by introducing today's guest presenters. Adam Gary is Senior Director of Education Strategy with Dell Technologies. Ellen Crompton serves as Executive Director at the Research Institute of Digital Innovation in Learning. And Michael Javor, MJ, is Chief Innovation Officer with Microsoft Education. I'd like to start with a quick overview of today's webinar. I already ran through brief introductions from today's panelists. The content will start with a brief history of artificial intelligence and what it is. From there, we'll transition into a specific type of artificial intelligence, one that's really dominating headlines of late, chat GPT. What is it and what does it mean for school? We'll then transition into a quick conversation of a related topic, chat GPT hallucinations. And then for the stuff that we think is really relevant and probably of most interest to today's participants, our panelists will discuss the potentials and possible problems of AI and chat GPT in the educational settings. And we'll conclude with a conversation on the research on chat GPT in education before finally concluding with questions and answers to make sure we fully address the content that you're interested in. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, MJ, who's going to get us started with an artificial intelligence brief history. MJ? It's used for broadly training computers to do tasks that a human would otherwise do. Um, again, it's an older um, computer structure that enables us to train tasks, uh, train computers to do tasks at scale. A large language model is more recent, five to six years old. And that is modeling after massive amounts of data, typically text data, but could it also include images and, and other forms of um, unstructured data where the computers can actually start to interpret and, and learn how to differentiate and even generate, like to generate a summary, um, generate code and other types of um, tooling. So you can go to the next slide. So taking a look at a, a brief history of artificial intelligence, you can see we started around the 1950s um, where we were looking at mostly task training um, headed down in the 19, 1959 to build out what we called machine learning models that enables us to um, build computing that can actually learn from existing data sets and even learn from itself. And then you've got deep learning that is more recent, 2017, where the, the techniques would be able to assist in decision making um, and similar to the neural networks that you would see in a human. And then we can go down to the, you can fast forward one more, Noel. And lastly, most recently, generative AI which is creating new content, um, written, visual, or auditory um, from wrapping around those, um, those other forms of AI. And now you can head to the next slide. So where do we fit in all of this? Um, you know, this is a, a hallucination, an AI hallucination that I generated in MidJourney. And it enables, there are similar models in DALI and, and other forms of, um, of the visual form of AI. This was this prompt was to create a brain and a heart together, vivid and alive. So you can see how um, the computer was generating this creative, um, what we would call an AI hallucination, um, in order to respond to my prompt. Um, as these technologies become more cognitive and more capable, um, it's expecting us to be more human. And so our role in all of this is to make sure that we are continually staying in touch with our humanity and how we interact, not just how we prompt it, um, but also how we use it. You can head to the next slide. So um, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need. 
This is a um, hierarchical structure to show um, how data is used and how it gets fed into AI. So it starts out with raw input, um, which is collecting um, diverse sets of information, um, including images, text, and other types of sensor data. Um, you can go up to the next. There's then data modeling and processing, which is using algorithms to, um, to study the patterns in that data. And you can see I've got some examples there, like the example for raw input would be gathering multimedia content for a biology lesson on plant cells. Um, for data modeling and processing, it could be analyzing student performance trends through pattern recognition and test scores. Um, we can go to the next transition. And then neural networks, which is applying deep learning. And I had mentioned before that was that kind of most recent phase prior to getting to generative AI. And that's building a human-like neural network that can um, adjust and adapt to those patterns. Um, and then we can go to the next. Now, this is where we transition into um, generative AI. There's a higher order cognitive system or structure um, that enables complex learning like language enables you to use um, AI almost like a user interface into data. And so an example here is the natural language processing um, to create personalized feedback for student essays. We can go to the next. And then there's an initial output that gets produced from this form of AI, and that will typically be broken down into a fact um, or something that is a piece of data that is accurate um, and a hallucination together. And then we can go to the last transition. And typically it's those two things that will break you to a, an inspired output. And when you are doing things like um, building a self-driving car or using it in medicine or education, you're gonna wanna veer towards um, fact and accuracy. And when you're doing things creative like building the heart image, you're gonna wanna veer towards um, hallucination and creativity. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, this is a, an analogy that I'm, uh, this image was uh, produced in Dolly, by the way. This is, a, you can see the prompt at the bottom, if you're able to see it, it's a wood table, metal nail on the table, hammer on the table, um, and tiny little text at the bottom right. And, uh, and this is a story that I'm talking to folks all over the country um, about in education, which is, let's say that you're, as we're talking to students, you give them a wood table next to them, and there's a nail on that table, and six inches from that nail is a hammer. And you're telling the, the child, push the nail into the table with your thumb and push hard. And whatever you do, don't look at the hammer. Don't touch the hammer. In a world where 50 to 70% of teachers are already actively using um, AI, whether it's for creating rubrics, rubrics or generating uh, course content, uh, you know, we have to think about what our response to our kids is going to be, particularly when this tool is so deeply embedded already in our in our workforce and our, our the role of education is to produce um, kids that are ready for life and ready for work. Um, so that is a basic overview of AI and um, I'll hand it off to our next speaker. And so Helen, this is where I want to turn to you and ask, what is chat GPT? And really, how is this different from Google search? Absolutely. So this is the golden question that everybody's asking me at the moment. What is ChatGPT? Well, it's actually a chat bot. And if you click to the next slide, you'll see something that you're probably familiar with a kind of a chat bot doing where you go onto a website and you say, oh, you know, what? how can you help me? OK, I'd like to help with finding a watch. I would like to do this. We have it on banks. We have that on multiple different websites. This is one form of chatbot, but if you go to the next slide, we've got, and this is, this is my kind of projected image of it. So we have the very basic chatbots on the left. That's like when you're kind of text into a computer. Well, on the right, you're kind of texting again to the computer, but it's like you're talking to this expert being. It's, I don't know whether you recognize the figure there from Iron Man Jarvis, or if you're a Star Trek person, Data, who was a kind of like a person you asked lots of questions and you had conversations back and forth, and they seem to have the answer to everything. It's kind of like jumping to that. 
Um, that progression has been very quick, very rapid, very drastic, going from this basic to this kind of expert being, kind of. Um, but if you go to the next slide, I'm going to explain a little bit more. So you might think, well, it can answer questions. And Google, the home of ubiquitous answers, has done that for ages. We type in a prompt, like if you click on the next slide, I've typed in here, what are Newton's laws of motion? And the next slide will show that it will give us an answer, as in, oh, you might want to look here, you might want to look here on these different websites. Google has not changed greatly in the last 20 years. It actually has some artificial intelligence, rank brain and BERT in the background. But the idea is still the same, that you ask a question and it shows you websites where you could possibly find the answer to your question. What's different about ChatGPT, if you switch to the next slide, is when you ask a question, like explain nuclear fusion in simple terms, it tells you the answer. It directly puts the answer there for us in text, also later on in images and so on. But it, it finds the answers. But I have to tell you the difference here. It's not just picking text up from the web and grabbing it in and putting it together. It's actually looking at that information on the web and forming often new sentences to tell you the answer. So if you actually put this um, explain nuclear fusion in simple terms into chat BPT, it will probably look different than here. It'll tell you the same answer, but it's like talking to a person. They'll always tell you slightly differently each time, still giving you hopefully the correct answer. So if you click to the next, what I'd like to share is the GPT part of this, because this tells you a lot about what's going on. And it's important to know GPT is not just for chat GPT. If you've ever heard of the great protein folder um, that predicted how proteins were going to fold, a, a magnificent AI new tool, that actually really kind of took us worlds ahead in what we can do with protein. Um, that is actually called Prot GPT-2. So it's not just for that. What it's doing is it's telling us three things. The G stands for generative. It's part of the AI field that's creating things like generating, um, chat GPT generates text originally. Um, you have also generative AI that creates images like DALI. You have it that creates music, video even now. So it's generative, it's generating, creating. The P stands for pre-trained. That means it's been given a large amount of data, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, but it's been given a lots of data that informs it to the answer the questions the prompts correctly, hopefully, again. Then the last bit here is transformer. So T for transformer, and that's describing the architecture of the AI model. That's kind of more of a computer science term that tells you what's happening with the artificial intelligence. So chat GPT, um, now you know kind of what is going on there. Now the pre-trained, when we go on to the next slide, this again is important in knowing what it's pre-trained on. So the original chat GPT that was um, sent out, what was it, November the 30th, 2022, had, because it was developed by Microsoft, um, um, Bing and OpenAI together, working together, they used all the internet information that they had on Bing to 2021. They also put in some other things like a Wikipedia in there. Then that third part was they had human labeling. So when it give a answer, you'd have humans saying, yeah, that's a good answer. That's not too good. So you had those pieces. Then you had ChatGPT come out. Now the arrow carries on because as we know, it's continually evolving, improving, 
learning um, given further information to help us know, go further. So next slide. And this is where the next slide will bring in our third speaker, Adam. Can you speak to hallucinations and what that means for this webinar today? Sure. And um, I think both speakers have already used the word hallucination. And MJ kind of used it in a fashion that might make you think, oh, wait, a hallucination could be a good thing because it could be on the creative side. But the way we're talking about it a lot uh, today with GPT is that uh, essentially to just distill it down, it makes stuff up. So sometimes it just is going to get things wrong. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. So you can see um, on the left-hand side where it gets stuff wrong, um, but also can correct itself. And then on the right-hand side, where some of these tools that we're now using to see, you know, our, our kids cheating, how they get things wrong as well. So on the left-hand side, uh, this was in a YouTube video that I'll post um, where a distinguished lecturer from Microsoft was sharing some stuff around GPT. And he asked it at the top there, seven times four plus eight times eight. And GPT said 120. And then it started to then show its work. And then it came back with 92. And so he typed in, well, wait, which one is it? And then uh, GPT said, oh, sorry, that was a typo. But really it was a hallucination. He got, it got it wrong at the beginning. Then when it started to check its work, it realized I got that wrong. And it's not great at this yet. I will tell you, though, from 3.5 to 4.0, it's gotten a lot better at um, arithmetic and showing the work. Um, I actually had a blog I'll post in there recently, and I was asking GPT just about AI and education. And what it wrote about personalized learning to me was a hallucination because it wasn't accurate. It didn't at all talk about voice and choice for students. Um, it was really much more about how do we uh, get information to a teacher, but not to the to the student? Um, so I consider that a hallucination. Um, and, and the point to that and the point to the article is to say what MJ said earlier, if you just copy and paste out a GPT and you're not thinking about it and thinking about the information and how you're using it, you, you're not using the tool correctly. Um, it can get you a lot of the way there, but it's not gonna get you all the way there. And then on the right, Someone had the great idea of using one of those AI detection tools and they copy and pasted the US Constitution in, and it came up with a 92.26 percentage rating that this was generated by AI, which I don't know, maybe there was AI back then, who knows? Um, and that's what they were using for the US Constitution, but uh, that to me is a huge hallucination on the, on the other side of this with the tools. Um, so this is kind of the cautionary part of it as well, which is to understand it is not 100% accurate. So I'm going to go ahead right there and stop our share to get a little bit more into the conversational part of today's webinar. And I want to start with something that's more of a framing question, first of all. So we'll go around Robin. We'll go in the same order that we went through the first part. So we'll go to MJ and then Helen and then Adam. Can you each give one potential positive use of generative AI and then one potential problem? MJ? Sure. So, I mean, I can think of many positive uses, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just to give one um, idea is to be able to, I know that there is um, a short of, of teachers across the U.S. and that we're looking for ways to support and accelerate um, um, a, a teacher's ability to support their classrooms and their schools. So being able to provide back-end administrative support, whether it's in scheduling, rubric development, um, grading, or resource management, um, I think is um, one major um, positive element of generative AI. And that includes things like being able to generate examples or um, generate custom examples um, for um, uh, a child. Taking a look at some of the negative areas, um, at least one dominant one is uh, data privacy, and it does require a lot of data to be very effective. Um, so being able to make sure that we've got um, an, an ethical data privacy structure. Um, I think many of you know Microsoft has responsible AI principles. Um, and other elements that that we we live by here, but um, I think that's something that we need to watch out for. Okay. 
Yep. So um, for me, it's the same thing. It's choosing one from each. So for me, I would say it's the equity piece that's the positive. Um, the fact that there's access information. To me, it's like when we had the internet first came out, it was everybody had access. It's like going back to the Gutenberg printing press. We all had information there. This has been a game, big game changer in equity in that providing that information, providing not just information, but services like marketing, um, admin people to help you organize things. It's that personalized learning, giving choice and voice to students, tutoring on steroids, promotes inclusivity, um, diverse backgrounds, diverse languages. It provides so much on the equity, even supporting teachers, creating accommodations and modifications for students with disabilities and um, IEPs. So you've got that positive use. With it being so powerful at the same time, it can be used negatively. That if we put the blinkers on and ignore this, students can actually, rather than using critical thinking skills, they can go the very opposite and use, literally generate, have a generation of non-thinkers in that they can just take these prompts that their educators are giving them, the teachers are giving them, put them into chat GPT to get the answer. So that's what we don't want to happen. That is a major problem that I can see. Thank you. So Helen, yeah. I'm going to take your major problem and I turn it into a positive. I also think, especially that 80-20 rule I said earlier, there's so much potential for creativity and critical thinking. Um, and a couple of examples I'd use is like, as a teacher, you know, you just don't have enough time to give all the examples and or when a student's writing a persuasive essay, you can't tell them all the things that, you know, the opposite side might think. However, you could go into GPT and say, here's my position. What would someone opposing this think and give the student enough information to be able to go write that paper in, in the right style and in the right way. Um, so I think it, it provides for that. Also, even from a school system level, we spend a lot of time on strategic plans. It's a long process. And I agree that sometimes the process is just as important as the output. However, if you could just put into GPT, hey, you know, I'm writing a strategic plan, give it some um, hints of what you're actually looking for in your plan and say, what would be a good starting point and use that, you might be able to then focus more on how do you operationalize that plan in creative ways rather than just writing the plan. Um, so I think there's huge uh, potential there. I, when I look at the thing that you know probably is most troublesome for me is we really didn't nail digital literacy when we were just using Google. And now these AI tools are bringing it to a whole new level, especially around video um, and, and pictures um, and the ability to understand if we ask kids to do a low level task, you know, what are they going to produce with this? If any of you are following the example over the uh, over the last probably five days with music, um, Drake and The Weeknd had a song come out that was completely produced by AI um, called The Heart on My Sleeve, um, which brought the music industry right back to their Napster days, right? Um, so there's going to be a lot more disruption that comes out of this. And if we can't detect you know, what's a real song or not, which I was doing this weekend with the kids. Is this a real song or an AI song? And they were trying to predict which one it was. Um, we're going to be in trouble. So we really do need to um, get very focused on digital literacy. We look at the way we've been rolling this out and add this component to it. So I liked hearing the positives and the things to consider. But one thing I did kind of glean from all three of the presenters was a reference or a nod to what we need to know, what we may know, what we should probably keep an eye on, which to me brings to mind a question around research. So Helen, if I may, I'd like to actually ask you to just share some framing comments with research around generative uh, AI in education. Absolutely. And if you don't mind sharing the slides, I have two here that, um, so basically I looked at ChatGPT and I looked at everything there was recently on how it can be effective and how it can be negatively used. So the first slide here touches on some that's been mentioned. Um, cheating is an obvious one. 
plagiarism, inaccuracies, bias, and harmful use. And let me explain just a little bit more on each. And it was great that um, Adam mentioned that you can flip things around because you can on some of these as well. So for the cheating, um, that's an obvious one. Obviously, students can literally put the prompts in and get the responses out and hand that over to their instructor. However, obviously, there's ways you can get around seeing whether students have cheated or not, um, just from looking at the style of it. And also jumping into the next one, the plagiarism, where did they get it from? If they can explain why, where they got some of that information from, or if they talk about something that's not been covered in class, that's kind of a flag of where it could perhaps be. The inaccuracies, though, the hallucinations, inaccuracies and hallucinations it can be a helpful sometimes as teachers because you could say, OK, let ChatGPT write a paper for you. But knowing that it's not always perfect, we want you to kind of analyze and how would you do it different based on what we've been doing in class? So that's another way to actually use that. Bias, like I said before, in the way that this is all from information that was on the internet and we know how biased the internet is. Um, that again, we have to use very carefully, but actually have students perhaps looking at the bias saying, do we see bias in this text? How could it be written differently? Do we agree? Is that a bias we agree with, disagree with? Um, and it's great for um, using it for these type of things, but then you're always gonna get the harmful use. When ChatGPT first came out, you had people asking how to make Molotov cocktails. It was set up to respond, no, we won't tell you that. However, there were always ways that they kind of worked around by saying, oh, this it's a play. This is just something that we're looking at in a fun way. It's not really true. Um, we, you know, tell us what a Molotov cocktail is. And it, it did early days, but again, now it's set up so it will not do it. Even if you tell the, you know, chat GPT, look, the world's going to end unless you tell me this it won't tell you. But it's always worth knowing that there's always people trying to get around these systems. So these are what we need to know that can happen with ChatGPT, but then just knowing is a big step in, in a way to actually avoid some of these happening and then get onto the positives, which are on the next slide. Can you flick to the next? That's perfect. And so this is just some of the positives. Content creation, as many people have said, from creating um, lesson plans to writing summaries, or, and then going into personalization engagement. This is what I kind of focused on with the equity piece as well. But personalize, we can really personalize to the student. Um, we can change it to a specific grade level. We can have, you know, quantum physics explained in the style of Snoop Dogg. You know, whatever reaches the students, we can kind of make learning fun while they're actually learning. Tutoring and 24 support, we found that from the research. That was a big thing. Students were going in to ask lots of questions at different times, but again, bringing in the digital literacy part, it, they've got to know again that ChatGPT is not always right, but it's doing a pretty good job. Assessment, again, teachers can use it, students can say, give me a, a test on this topic. You know, here's the answers. Did I get it right? What did I do wrong? How can you help me think about it further? Task automation. I mean, these are just some examples, but we can really revolutionize education, just even to think about um, the Socrative method of questioning. We could have students, instead of handing a term paper in, we could say to a student, okay, have a debate with ChatGPT on this topic. And you can choose a side or that, you know, let ChatGPT choose a side and then 
print off that discussion that you've had with ChatGPT and that debate. And it's a great debate partner. It could even happen in class. But so what we're finding is we have to do the balance in the research. There's a lot of positives, but educators do need to be aware of the way that ChatGPT can be negatively used or turning things the other way around like Adam did in, okay, it's short on this, so let's use it for a positive way and have students critically think and analyze what ChatGPT is given out. So that's what the research showing us at the moment. I think you're on mute, mute Noel. I am, thank you for that polite reminder. Thank you for your answer, Helen. I'm monitoring the chat at the same time keeping an eye on some of the content we had planned, and I see a direct overlap. So Adam, I see you responding to Shanna's question about implementation. So I actually would like to start with you with what one of our next question was, which was, what does district adoption and integration of AI look like? And to take a specific question from the chat that's somewhat tangential, is asking, what's the best way to convince boards and community members that we can't ignore this and should continue to update our policies to reflect guidance for staff and students? Yeah, there's a lot there. I'll have my friends jump in and, and help me. Um, so uh, I would say first, first and foremost, what we did is we actually went into GPT and said, hey, what, what are those outcomes that we should be delivering to to help folks understand how this is gonna impact education, right? Um, and then we put together nine modules, starting with the basics all the way down to prompt engineering, uh, think something on bias and um, and um, all the things that were plagiarism, all the things we were just talking about. And I think the best starting point for school systems is to figure out where where are you at, what are the outcomes that you want to get to in the short term versus the long term, and then how do you then make sure that you educate the right people in that process. We have some that are just starting with, okay, we got to put a training together for teachers, show them how to use this, which is pretty powerful. However, you're going to then have to answer a bunch of questions about bias and things that you might not be ready to answer if you haven't done that work at the district level yet. You might not have upgraded your AUP, um, student code of conduct, and those things you might be thinking about as well, um, because you have to also look at what age are they allowed to use these tools? And how are you going to answer that question if a parent asks you that? So there's there's a lot of things that kind of roll into this. So if you have the right outcomes, that's where we started with. And then you have the modules that kind of support that. And then literally, like, this stuff is changing, like, weekly. So you have to have good um, thought partners that can kind of keep you updated in that process and help, and help you with it. Um, and from a board perspective, um, I would say it's the same, right, except for... Like, I think it was great how the example was earlier, which was like, explain this in this way. You might have to say in very simplistic terms, what does this look like? But also, I think from the board member's perspective, they need to see how is this impacted in the, in, you know, the world of work, right? And or how would I use this in my life today? And then start applying it to the questions we need to answer for the school so they can see the wide range of what's going on with this tool. Helen or MJ, do you have anything you'd like to add about implementation for district leaders? Sure. Uh, you know, just to add on to what Adam um, was saying, I mean, I, yes, absolutely. You can use ChatGPT to come up with, um, with ideas and uh, building awareness is certainly critical because it's hard to respond to things that you don't know um, or unfamiliar with or even worse or scared by. So I, I would certainly um, suggest awareness being a, um, very high priority when it comes down to understanding what the, I mean, this, this tool will impact the, the world. And so, you know, we have to figure out what our response is just going back to the hammer, um, just seeing the hammer on the table um, or telling a person, whether it's a child or a teacher or an administrator, don't use the hammer, don't look at the hammer. Um, I, I don't think it's a sufficient response. I don't think that's an adequate way to, um, to be able to engage with uh, the type of change that's happening culturally 
and um, and particularly in education. So my you know recommendation is both awareness and figure out what your perspective is, and then wherever you feel like there are strengths and weaknesses in your perspective, research, learn, talk to the experts, and engage in the topic. Um, it's going to whatever AI is today, it will not be that tomorrow. And so engaging with the topic is really critical. Um, those who are have their fingers on the pulse of it are seeing the rate of change. Um, so just make sure you're on, you're on top of it and engaged. Uh, and edu policy, everyone on this call knows, is very slow. And so being able to have this conversation now um, is going to be really critical, particularly when policies need to come now and also potentially later. Ellen? Yes, and I'm just going to echo what you both said in that the big thing for me is education, education, education. People are very fearful of things I'll often ask. I'll say, oh, you know, what do you think of chat GPT? And they'll tell me how terrible it is. And I'll say, oh, have you used it? And they'll say, oh, no. And it's kind of, we've got to educate people. We need to make sure people are clear what it can do. And also where, like I said, it can be misused. So that is it for me. I've always been asked as well about um, regulations and policies. Initially, I, I think we're in a super hard place to actually put all these things in place because it's a moving target. Like someone said on the call today that it's literally weekly and I'm literally looking daily at updates from ChatGPT to find out what's happening, listening to podcasts, listening to other people that are using it constantly finding out about it, but we need to get this message out. But then at some point we need to develop a general set, but small districts, I would probably look to what other people are doing or even the, the nation at the moment. There's a lot going out there at the moment nationally on regulations for generative AI. No one's actually managed to do it yet but they're all working towards, and we can learn from some of those. Because like I said, where anything we put in place is gonna change, we'll have to be very agile and pivot within a moment's notice. And Helen, just to add on to what you're saying, and then Noel, we can go to the next question. Um, I, I think it's important that folks also um, tack onto something that Adam and Helen were talking about earlier, and I wanna just call it out and emphasize it. It's an accessibility tool in as much as it is anything else. And so whether it's a teacher that needs support or a student that needs support, we understand that the students will decline as they keep hitting blockages in their growth and in their learning and development. And so this is something that can ensure that the folks who aren't able to make it through the system can have an, that extra tool that enables them to get through. Um, and the interesting thing about this tool is that it customizes itself to that person's environment, to their language, to their culture, to their knowledge level. Um, so you could have a 15 year old that's operating at a ninth, a nine, you know, a nine year old grade level, and this tool could actually help bridge that gap. So um, accessibility is certainly like a, a big topic and, and it doesn't have to be AI in order to understand the AI underneath it, right? Autocomplete, for example, is an example of AI in practice. And Noel, I'm sorry, but that was fantastic what you were saying, Michael, Len, that it, it is all those things and thinking about it from the educator side, I know a lot of educators are feeling guilty in a way using it like, oh, I used it to write a lesson plan. I used it to write a test and they're keeping kind of quiet about it. We need to set a new tone of educators work so hard. If there's a tool out there that's helping them do their job even better, we need to encourage that use. But there is that feeling at the moment like, oh, I, I kind of cheated. It's not, it's not cheating. It's being logical and keeping your head above water and doing a great job. It sounds a little bit like working smarter, not harder, but it goes back to data literacy and good practices, right? So do you use AI to jumpstart and get your first draft? So you're 20% into the thought process, but then how do you give credit? How do you reflect that? How is that appropriate? And how do you own that? Now I am, this is almost like a tale of two cities. We have a pretty 20,000 foot conversation going on right here on the webinar. And I'm looking at the very direct questions in the chat. So what I'm going to do, I have one more framing question that I think gets to something all three of you touched on, which is 
re related to the fact that these discussions don't happen in silos. So I want to ask one more question that's kind of 20,000 foot level. Then I want to get into some of the very specific questions coming from the participants today. And I'll remind everyone that yes, the recording is available. The PowerPoint will be included in the content that we send in follow-up. And for the request, we'll also send the links and a summary of the chat. That way you have both conversations at your fingertips. The last framing question, and then we're gonna abandon the plan questions for the panelists. What should we be thinking about around data, privacy, bias, and ethics? And I think this is important because if you think it's good enough to answer just one of these questions, you are missing the reality of implementation in any setting, specifically education. I'm going to drop two chats, two links in the chat related to an upcoming webinar series that we're running around student and data privacy, as well as one related to a cybersecurity cohort that we are partnering with Dow to offer our superintendents. And I think you'll understand how all three go hand in hand. Uh, but we'll look for those resources. And I want to go in the same order. So starting with you again, MJ. What do we need to be thinking about around data privacy, bias, and ethics? Uh, sure, happy to kick off. So I did mention Microsoft's responsible AIs. I think there are many organizations that are either adopting that or, or building their own responsible AI um, ethical frameworks. So you can certainly um, look them up and engage. It's a great place to get familiar with um, key elements of um, of that and, I, and Helen and, and Adam both touched on various elements of that, um, whether it's uh, you know transparency around the model or reducing bias and, and other um, key elements. In terms of data privacy, you know I can speak to the Microsoft version. I, I think um, many of you may know that OpenAI um, has is hosting their technology um, in the Azure cloud in Azure OpenAI, and if you are looking at starting that journey, I think the first place is to not worry about AI. I, I call this a vegetables and dessert conversation, actually, with all the ones that I'm speaking to. So I know everyone wants to get to the dessert as quickly as possible, but I need to reinforce with people that they need to eat their vegetables. Um, and that means setting up a proper data lake house. Um, and there are very simple um, single click ways to do that now. Um, but setting up your, your data warehousing strategy is one and ingesting data in a healthy way. Um, some people are shifting from doing lots of transformation and cleansing of data to being to just loading of data so that it's easier and faster to create your data warehouses and then apply security and governance around that. Um, and then secondly, making sure that um, other areas of your either education policy or your cyber enforcements are in place. Um, once you've got your data aggregated in a way that um, is not going to impact your students or your school or your district negatively, um, then you can do all sorts of dessert-like functions um, with um, OpenAI and other cognitive services um, like vision and um, recognition, et cetera. So I would, um, you know, I, I, again, just reinforce everyone to to engage in the vegetables conversation with your teams and make sure um, that you're, you're being responsible. One just key thing to note is that um, Azure OpenAI does not use your data to, to inform the model. So your, the model overall is not learning from you or your data. Um, we do not use any of your data in, in any kind of training exercise. Um, your data is your data. And making sure that you have your data um, in a secure way is critical for the next phase of how you um, iterate with AI. Hey, MJ, real quick, um, I maybe bring them, I'm going to bring them into a window of the chats that you and I have daily, which is on this bias piece. So I think it's important. And it's kind of brought me into uh, an interesting part in my career as I look at bias. Of course, I've read all of Daniel Kahneman stuff on heuristics and bias, but reading it and applying it's very different. And people are very afraid of bias in AI systems. However, we don't talk about the bias that actually is within the human. So can you talk a little bit about like how we're trying to view bias and actually this is helping us understand how humans bring bias to this whole process. And maybe Helen has some thoughts on this as well too. In fact, Michael, before you jump in, um, can I add to the bias the component? If you remember Please, seeing how yeah. ChatGPT was developed, it was developed by 
um, what's on the internet, but then also had that piece of human bias where someone decided, okay, that's a good response, that's not. So you've got the whole that piece at the same time. To me, to be honest, um, that's something that people need to be aware of, and that's part of critical thinking, being active consumers. But if you could just add that in as well to your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, Helen and Adam are definitely tackling key areas of this conversation. And um, it's important to understand that they're very human. Like, if you look at Helen's slide talking about all the challenges with GPT, I was like, I was actually mentioning that. I'm like, those are the challenges of being human. <laughs> um, so it's got it right, I guess. And, uh, you know, you're going to see a, a different elements of our humanity come across in how um, GPT develops. And it's certainly interesting um, to see that at scale, right? Now, there, there are also ways for us to, uh, from like a rules-based ethics standpoint, to make sure that we're guiding uh, these um, tools and we're guiding our use of the tools. And I, I think that's where we've got to make sure that we're not um, teaching it to um, be biased um, and we're reducing biases in the system in the same way that we would do with a human. Right. So if we would the, the way that we sh would teach a child um, is the same way that we would be able to teach GPT to learn and understand um, those things as they're they're relevant and important to development in our society and culture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so I think the example that I saw on this, um, especially going back to what MJ was talking about, was like when you are raising your child and you teach them something are they, have they internalized it to be, you know, the way that they respond because that's the way they feel or are they responding because they think that's the way you're supposed to respond to something. And that, I know that gets really heavy, but that's kind of what you have to understand with the GPT model. It doesn't feel it's responding because it thinks that's the next thing in the logical sequence of things. It's not to the level of, of a feeling about something yet. There's a very detailed or very technical question related to this conversation in the chat. How do you or could you use data literacy to help parents who might be worried about AI being one-sided and that helping to ensure that schools aren't going to create a certain type of student? I mean, this is a heavy question as well. If you could answer this in the next three minutes, so I think you could go into a different line of work, but what does that look like? Just very quickly, and I, I am not chat GPT myself, but I'm sure that it would come up with a great answer in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, the answer is yes, um, you absolutely can. I think one of the key elements of being able to engage with um, parents or teachers, honestly, it doesn't matter who you're engaging with, is understanding who you're speaking to. What is their cultural frame of reference? What is their language? What age um, level are you, do you need to speak to them at? And those are things that are settings. You know, you can you can tell GPT um, to communicate in a certain culture at a certain age level um, and being able to reduce uh, um, very complex concepts into simple um, ways of understanding and so much so that you can even ask it to tell a story um, in, a, in a certain amount of words. And so there are various ways to engage with parents and children and teachers, um, depending on who they are. Adam and Helen. Yeah, go ahead, Helen. You're fine. I can be fairly quick. It's um, basically what MJ said, but it's just data literacy. Um, it, information, data literacy, it's all that for all people. We definitely can't leave parents out because we've just got to come from where their place of fear is to yeah. kind of turn it around and say, you know, look, I know you're worried about these. We need to acknowledge that. And then, but look at this, but this is a great moment. And this is a great moment in history. And if we actually look back at all the places in history, you can see that technology has always caused great fear. Yeah, so I would, I would say from a parent perspective, like there's power in the tool, but most parents that I've met, I mean, you know, when I was teaching and beyond, you know, they want great things for their kids. And there is a strand of this we haven't talked about, but I know many superintendents are thinking about, which is how do we build this into workforce readiness, right? So as part of that conversation, if you're going to be building, you know, programs that allow students to learn how to build AI or be part of that conversation, I mean, 
we need more philosophers, right? We need more people who can really engage in this conversation from many different uh, perspectives if we're going to get this right. And this really lends itself to what Tony has been putting in the chat, which is right. Like, this is what everyone's been saying. It's been trained on a model and there are guardrails put on this thing. And, you know, of course, politics is going to come into it, but we have to make sure as these things iterate that we're doing them in a way that's productive for society um, and not feeling like the models are producing things that are trying to persuade someone one way or the other. If we do this the right way, we're going to expose people to multiple perspectives, which they're just not getting on the internet right now in social media or Google because the way that the algorithms are set. Um, but I agree with you, Tony, these things have to get better. So going in a slightly different direction, I think very appropriately, a lot of the conversation around chat, G GPT and AI has been focused on student, student instruction, student learning and student experience. But I, re I represent AASA and we support superintendents. And it's been hinted at in the chat, I think there's huge administrative or operations related opportunities here as well, which I think could then indirectly free up staff capacity or staff burden to then allow the humans to do more of the instructional based work. Can you speak to that at all? And I will totally own to the panelists that this is not a scripted question, so we're riffing here, but the, the operational functions of AI for administrators and for teachers to free up more student facing time. Yeah, so someone asked me recently, they were like, when did this become a moment where you were like, wow, this is watershed, like this is really gonna help. And it was actually a moment I had with MJ at a innovate, innovation summit we were running. And there was, um, there was probably 40 people in the room trying to redefine an elementary school schedule. And they had worked on it for a full day without using GPT. And then MJ walked in and they were using it. He started to teach them how to prompt engineer. And within, I'd say 15 minutes, um, a schedule was on the screen. And then, and then MJ said, look at the schedule and pretend, you know, as if you're a special education teacher, what are some of the issues you'd have with the schedule? And it started to produce that and they were flawed. And like, this is stuff that takes, you know, days and days and days, anyone at a district level knows. And this, it got them 80% there. They left there with a great frame with just, you know, some teaching on prompt engineering that MJ was doing. So like those types of things that have taken a long time, this can definitely be a friend. It can yeah, also and, go into, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, and I'll go after you. I was going to say, it always goes into the equity piece as well, that these small schools that don't have these resources now actually have resources. Like um, the university I'm at, it's a large university, but smaller ones, just the same as smaller schools, they don't have those marketing people. They don't have those people that can spend ages. And this provides great equity in that they can have chat GPT doing that. Look, just like you described then by those perfect prompts, understanding how to use the tool to ask the right questions, you can get that information out. MJ. Uh, absolutely, Helen. And I think that as we look towards, um, and this is something that we have thought about, but whether it's agents that help um, great teachers become even better, or teachers that need assistance um, to become in a full teaching role, uh, or it's lesson planning and rubric design, being able to assist in various, various areas of the back office as education policy is being formed and thought of, think about scheduling. I mean, scheduling at a district level can take thousands and thousands of hours, lots of people and lots of pain. Um, you know, when looking at various elements of communication and resource management, um, what grading and assessment, lesson planning. So there, there are various elements, I think, of back office areas and um, facilitation, acceleration, tooling that can significantly change the landscape without having to disrupt the education policy. And, uh, you know, I... I you know, again, those two, th three things from, from today, at least for me, just to re-emphasize, re, um, one, eat your vegetables, like understand the technologies that you're dealing with here and get engaged yourself on use cases. Um, two, being able to look at back office things while education policy is being built 
and reach out to Adam, myself, any, anyone in your team, uh, Helen, I'm not sure if you are on the implementation side, um, but certainly reach out to us and see um, within our organizations even how we can help you. Um, third, make sure that you come up with an opinion. Remember the hammer. The hammer is, 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 is that um, story is there to help you figure out what is your opinion. Should the child use the hammer or not? Should the teacher use the hammer or not? If so, how? How often, right? Like think through how you, what your response, your optimal response is, and then learn and iterate. Okay, both in terms of an ending note and an actual time constraint. I would like to just take a moment to thank our participants for taking an hour out of their day to listen to the ins and outs and ups and downs and all the possibilities of AI and chat GPT in education. I would also like to extend a very sincere thank you to Helen, MJ, and Adam for being here today to have the conversation, offer their expertise and insights. And thank you to everyone. We will send around a recording. We'll share the resources and information dropped in the chat. And just remain here, happy to help serve and support the nation's public school superintendents. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you.